Uh, how many people program in a functional programming language? Okay, so halfway preaching to the converted and, and not in a functional programming language? A non-functional programming? So still a lot of that. Uh, I, I think this will be useful to both audiences in particular if you're not in a functional programming language. In fact, if you're not in Erlang, which I think has a complete story for how they do state. All the other functional programming languages have you know, two aspects. They have, this is the functional part, and then, and then, you know, Haskell has this beautiful side where the type system keeps this part pure, and then there's the other part, which is kind of imperative, do this, do that, and then they have a bunch of constructs to make, uh, provide facilities for when you need state on that side. Um, Similarly, there are a lot of hybrid functional languages like Scala and F Sharp, where I think there are questions to be asked about, okay, here's the pure part. What's the story about the other part? Uh, so what I want to do uh, today is to talk about functions and processes and to distinguish the two. Uh, in fact, uh, the core concept in this talk is, is to try to parse out what we mean by identity, state, and values try to separate those concepts uh, and see how programming with values, while a really important part of the functional part of your program, ends up being a critical part of the non-functional part of your program, the part that actually has to manage state and, and uh, behave as if things are changing. Uh, and there are two components to that. One is how do you represent composite objects as values? A lot of people who are new to functional programming wonder about the efficiency and representation issues there, and I'll talk about that. And finally, I'll talk about one approach uh, to dealing with state and change in a program, the one that Clojure uses, uh, which is compatible with the little bit of philosophy I'm going to start with. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about Clojure very much. How many people were at my talk yesterday? Okay. How many people who weren't know something about Clojure? Okay. Um, this is not really a closure specific talk. There'll be some code later and it shouldn't be too uh, threatening. I'm uh, just going to summarize quickly with this one slide what closure is about. It's a dynamic uh, programming language. It's dynamically typed. Uh, it's functional in particular. It's functional in emphasizing immutability, not just in high, you know, supporting higher order functions. Uh, all the data types in closure are immutable. Um, it supports concurrency in that it's a two-part story. One is you have to have good support for immutability and pure functions. The other part is uh, you have to have a story for when multiple things are happening at a time, and you're going to have some perceptible change, and Clojure does. In fact, it's, I think it's an important part of, of a language that you know, purports to be functional that have a story about the non-functional parts. Uh, Clojure is not particularly object-oriented. It may be clear after listening to this talk why not, because I think as currently implemented, a lot of object technologies have big problems when they face concurrency and functional programming. As I said, from a conceptual standpoint, nothing about this is really closure specific. Uh, so what do we mean by functions? I think that there's a really easy way to say, well, function is something that you call, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a very precise notion of a function, which is uh, something that you call that takes values as arguments and produces a value as a return uh, when it's given the same arguments, it always produces the same value. It doesn't depend on the outside world. It doesn't affect the rest of the world. So many methods in your classes are not functions by this definition. Uh, but in particular, too, uh, I want to highlight the fact that functions, pure functions, have no notion of time. Uh, time is going to be a critical notion uh, through this talk. So what is functional programming? I, there are lots of answers to this question, and I think people that are into type systems will claim uh, a stronger argument for what constitutes functional programming. Uh, but I'm going to limit the definition here to you know, programming that emphasizes programming with functions. So you want to try to write as much of your program as you can with pure functions. When you do that, you get a ton of benefits. They've been talked about in other talks. It's not really the focus of this talk other than to say, even without concurrency, uh, your program will be easier to, easier to understand, easier to reason about, easier to test, more modular, and, and, uh, and so forth. That all falls out of programming with functions to as great an extent as possible. On the other hand, when you step back and look at your entire program, very few programs on the whole are functions you know, that take a single input, think about it, and produce a single output. 
maybe some compilers or theorem provers work that way, but most real-world programs that I've worked on, and I think most real-world programs in the real world, uh, don't work that way. Uh, in particular, uh, well, even if you claimed your program was completely functional, uh, if it's going to produce any output, it's not, because otherwise it would just warm up the machine. But uh, even if it's mostly functional, there's still observable effects of a purely functional program running. Right? It's running on a computer. As soon as it's running on a computer, it's not math anymore. Right? It's a program running on a computer. It's consuming memory. It's consuming clock cycles. It's observably using, doing something over time. So all programs do things over time. Uh, but most real programs, as I say, actually have observable behavior. That is not just the fact that they're running on a computer, but that they're doing things. They're interacting with the outside world. They're talking over sockets. They're putting stuff on the screen. They're putting things in or out of the database. Uh, in particular, though, we'll use one critical measure about uh, how to define state, which is if you ask the same question twice and you get different answers, then there's state. I don't care where you put it. You put it in a process. You put it in an agent, an atom, you know, in a variable. It doesn't matter. In a database. If you answer, ask the same question twice and get different answers at different times, you have state. Um, so again, the word time just came up again there. Uh, so I think most programs are processes, which means we need to talk about the part of your program that can't be purely functional, the part that's going to have to produce a different answer at different times. How do you do that and not make a complete mess out of what you've created with the, the shiny, uh, pure part? Uh, in particular, though, I want to uh, highlight the fact that this talk is strictly about the notion of state and time in a local context. I'm talking about in the same process. There are a completely different set of requirements and characteristics of distributed programs where you cannot do the same things that you can do in the same process. So I'm talking only about same process concurrency and state. Uh, so I want to be a little bit more precise about what I mean when I say identity, state, and value, and these kinds of things. In particular, I want to talk about state, and I'll talk about it twice. One is just a sort of generic statement. State is a value of an identity at a time. Maybe none of that makes sense. Uh, maybe it sounds like a variable uh, from a traditional programming language, right? Because I think if you ask somebody who's using a traditional programming language, do you have state? You're like, yeah, I have some variables, and I change them, and... Uh, that is not a good sound definition of what constitutes state. Uh, so is our variable state, do they do this job? Do they manage the value of an identity at, over time? Uh, we could have a variable i, we could set it to 0, we could set it to 42, we could assign one variable to another, right? Is j 42? That depends. In a sequential program, Probably, kind of, sort of. In a program that had threads, what could go wrong? Well, I didn't say what order these things happened in, right? Or what threads they happened in. For instance, if you said j equals i in a separate thread, what bad thing could have happened to you? Would it see 42 necessarily? No, definitely not. Because that memory may not have been flushed through to the other thread's cache. Okay? It's not volatile necessarily, i. What else could happen that's bad? Maybe i is along. Maybe setting along is not atomic in your programming language. Bad. So variables are not going to be good enough to do the job of managing state. All right? They're predicated on a single thread of control. They actually don't work at all otherwise. They're horribly broken by concurrency. The whole notion of this piece of memory is does not work. And our programs are built substantially on this, whether it's a variable you know, sitting on the stack or fields in your object, same problems. Okay? Pieces of memory are insufficient abstractions. Uh, so we have the problem of non-atomicity non of long writes. Okay? That's a problem in a lot of languages. That's just not atomic. So you could get half of a number if you look at it from another thread. Um, write visibility and, and memory fences have to be accounted for once you have multiple threads of control on a true concurrent box. Um, if you have a, you know, an object and it has a bunch of these things collected together that constitute its state, now you have the problem of composing you know, a composite operation because making it into another valid state requires touching you know, several of these 
these variable things, uh, which now makes you, you know, impose locks or some sort of synchronization to say, stay away from me so I can pretend there's only one thread of control because that's what my language thought when they wrote it, uh, or the language they copied, you know, thought when they wrote it. Uh, all of these things are examples of the same problem. We're having to work around the lack of a model for time. Okay, because there's no point to have ver having variables if you don't have time. And just think about that for a second. If there's no time notion, why would you need a variable? If you can't go back to it later and see something different, how is it a variable? Uh, so, if we want to be clearer about time, which we're not going to be in a non-physics lecture, <laughs> Uh, we're just going to say some, what are some things you think of when you think of time? You think of things being before or after other things? You think of something happening later? Uh, you think of something happening at the same time? Two things happening at the same time? Uh, you think of something happening right now, which is sort of a self-relative perspective of time. Uh, but all these concepts are important in that they're inherently relative. Right? When you think about time, you, you don't, there's not a lot about time that's hours or you know, this particular moment you know, with a name on it. That's, most of our notions of time have to do with relative time, the ordering between two discrete things. What do we mean by values? Again, here's, a, here's an area where there's just so much ambiguity and loose thinking that we can't write correct programs until we sort of nail this down. So the, core characteristic of a value is that it's immutable, right? Some values are obvious, you know, numbers. We all are comfortable with that concept. It's a value. Uh, but I will contend that until you start thinking about composites of these things like numbers as values, you're doomed uh, the, in the future. You may not be doomed right now, but at some point uh, it's going to be a problem for your programs. Uh, so what, what went wrong? Okay, we all think 42 is, you know, indivisible. Of course, we saw if we stored it along, it may not be, depending on our language. But, but we, the, the idea of 42, we consider to be an atomic concept. But we have a big problem in the way we think about composite objects. Uh, some of that falls out of our languages, I think. You know, we, we have date libraries where you can set the month. It's a crazy concept. Right? There's, no, there's this date and there's that date. There's not setting the month of a date, and it's another date. I mean, that's the, right away you have that problem. I set the month of a date, and it's another date. If it's another date, you have two dates. You don't have one settable date. Uh, and our class libraries have destroyed our brains in this area. <laughs> also, the default behavior of our languages. You, know, you create a new class in most languages, and everything is variable, and instantly you have this stateful uh, mess that maybe you have to clean up with a lot of discipline on your part. So I'm going to contend that dates, sets, maps, everything is a value and should be treated like a value. And you should separate your concept of value from your concept of change. So one more concept in the philosophy portion of the talk, uh, which is the concept of identity. Okay, uh, This is probably the most nebulous of these things, but it's, it's an important thing. What happens in the real world? What happens in the real world when we talk about... Uh, you know, uh, today, or mom, or, you know, Joe Armstrong. Uh, is that a, a single, unchanging thing? Or, one way to think about it is, we have a logical entity that we associate with different values over time. Okay? In other words, at any particular moment, everything is frozen. Okay? In the next moment, we look, we see something different. Is that the same thing? Well, if, the same, if some force is acted on this thing to produce that next thing, I consider it to be the same thing. You know? Otherwise, they're unrelated things. Two things can pass through the same space. They're not the same thing because they're in the same space. So a set of values over time where the values are causally related is something we need to name. These are different values. right? They may be in different spaces. I could walk over here. I'm still rich. So what's happening? What's happening is uh, easy to understand if you have three notions, right? There's a state, I'm standing right here. There's a state, I'm standing over here, right? They're both values. You know, if you could stop time for a second, nothing about me would be changing. Uh, 
And it's me because, you know, I'm using my legs to move myself over here and I'm still talking. And you see a set of causal connections between me being here and being there. So you say, that's all rich. That's not two people, you know, doing this. Uh, identities are not the same things as names. I just want to make that clear. Okay, I have a mother. You now have that concept in your head, this entity, you know, this identity. Uh, but I call her mom and you would call her Mrs. Hickey, I hope. Uh, these identities can be composite. Right? We can talk about the New York Yankees or Americans, right? No problem. Those are sets, uh, but they're also identities. They change over time, but at any particular point in time, they have a value. These are the guys who are on the Yankees right now. Uh, any program that's a process needs to have some mechanism for identity. Okay? This all goes together. So I'll go back and talk about state. We have some terms that hopefully mean something, right? Now we can say a state is a value of an identity at a time. Hopefully that makes sense, right? The identity is the logical thing. It's not necessarily place. It's not a piece of memory, okay? A value is something that never changes, okay? And time is something that's relative. Now it's easy to see, I think, why we can't use variables for state. In particular, that variable may not refer to something that's immutable. So already, er, that's a problem. If you, refer, if you make a variable refer to a variable, okay, you're building on sand. Okay? The key concept is variable or whatever we're going to do to manage time has got to uh, refer to values. Sets of variables as we traditionally have them can never constitute a value because they're not um, atomically composite. Okay? Because we're saying a value is something that's immutable. If you could change the parts independently, then it's not immutable, right? Because there's going to be a moment when one part is halfway there and another part is not there. That's not a valid value now. You're, something's happening in the middle. And more globally, you can say about variables, their problem is they have no state transition management, okay? That's the management of time, a coordination model for time. How do you go from I'm in this state, now I'm in that state? Both states being immutable values. So this is the sum, summary of the philosophy portion. Uh, a key concept, I think, is things don't change in place. We think that they do, but they don't. The way you can see that this is the case is to incorporate time as a dimension. Okay? Once time is a dimension, once you have x, y, z time, guess what? <laughs> That's over here. If something is happening here, this is no different. Okay, things do not change in place. Time proceeds, functions of the past create the future. Okay? But both things are values. There are a couple of aspects, I think, to the design of the things I'm going to show you that I think are important when you try to model time in the local context. These are things I don't want to give up. These are things I know I can achieve by brute force in Java, and I can't sell my language if I can't achieve them in Clojure, for instance, which is co-located entities can see each other without cooperation. Okay? There's a lot of messaging models that require cooperation. You know, if I want to see what you're about, I have to ask you a question. You have to be ready to be asked that question. You have to be willing to answer my question. Uh, but that's not really the way things are when you're co-located. I, mean, I don't know what's happening in the next building, but I can see all of you, and I can certainly look at the back of your head without asking you permission. Um, the other thing I think is really important in a local context, it it's really should be written off as, as impossible in the distributed context, is you can do things in a coordinated manner with co-located entities in the same process. You can say, let's all work together and do this all right now. Um, as soon as you're distributed, you can't do that. So the models I'm going to show you support uh, visibility of co-located entities and coordination. So let's take a little example. A little race walker foul detector. Okay, race walkers, they have to walk, they can't run. They have to walk step, 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 heel, toe, and they, they can't have both feet off the ground at the same time. It's a foul, and then you get, you get kicked out of the race. So how do we do this? Well, we go and we get the left foot position, we see it's off the ground. We go and we get the right foot position, we say, oh, it's off the ground. So they're running, right? Yeah, it sounds funny, but you, I mean, everybody writes programs that do exactly this all the time. Exactly this. And you wonder, well, I mean, why, why didn't it work? 
Okay, we can't work that way. Okay, we can't have time and values all munched together where things are changing while we're trying to look at them. That doesn't work. We can't make decisions. We don't make decisions as human beings this way. Snapshots and the ability to consider something as a value at a point in time are critical to perception and decision making and they're as critical in programs as they are to us as human beings. If you look at our sensory systems, they're completely oriented on creating uh, momentary glimpses of a world that would otherwise just perceive to be you know, completely fungible. Uh, now, how do we achieve this you know, programmatically? Well, one of the things I think we have to advocate if we want to write programs that can work on multiple cores and benefit from being on multiple cores is we can't stop the race. We can't stop the runner. We can't say, Whoa, could you just hang out for a second? Because I want to see if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're running. Also, we can't expect the runner to cooperate. And say, could you just tell me if you're running? Uh, but if we could consider the runner to be a value, like this guy on the right here, it's kind of nice that we can look at him as if he was a value. There's a point in time that was captured by this photograph, right? There's a single value. I don't have to independently look at the left and right while time proceeds, right? I've got, I've got a value in hand. It was captured at a point in time. The race kept going, but I can see that guy's got a foul on the right. He's got both his feet off the ground. That's easy. That's the kind of easiness you want to have in the logic of your applications. You want to be working with values. You do not want to be working with things that are running away from you as you're trying to uh, examine them. So it's not a problem to do this work if we can get the runner's value. Um, in a similar way, we don't want to stop people from conducting sales so we can give them bonuses or do sales reports. We need to move to a world in which time can proceed and we can do our logic and we don't need to stop everybody so we can do our logic. The two things have to be independent. So how does it work? Well, the first thing is we have to program with values. We have to use values to represent not just numbers and even small things like dates, but pretty much everything. Collections, sets, things that you would have modeled as classes should be values. I'm not saying that you, there couldn't be an object-oriented system that worked this way. I don't know of one that does. Uh, but you should start looking at your entire object as if it was a value. It should never be in pieces that you could twiddle independently. You want a new state of that object, you make a new, entire new value. Uh, so then what's the problem with time? It becomes a much smaller problem. All we need to do is get some language constructs or some way uh, to manage the succession of values. Right? An identity is going to take on a succession of values over time. We just need a way to model that. Right? Because we have pure functions, we know how to create you know, new values from old values. We only need to, mo uh, to model the time coordination problem. Uh, what's nice about this is when you separate the two things, when you haven't unified values with pieces of memory, uh, you end up with multiple options for the uh, time semantics. You have a bunch of different ways to look at it. There's message passing and there's transactional. Uh, but because it's now a separate problem, uh, you can take different options. You can even have multiple options in the same program. Uh, so I'm going to say that there's a two-pronged approach. One part is programming with values. The other part is, in this, in this uh, example that I'm going to be talking about today, in Clojure's example, is a concept called managed references, which you can think of as they're kind of like variables, except it fixes all the problems with variables. In other words, they're variables that have coordination semantics. So they're pretty easy to understand. Uh, they're just variables that aren't broken. So there are two parts. We're going to talk now about the values. Okay, one of the things that people cringe at initially if they haven't used functional programming languages before is that sounds expensive. You know, if I have to copy the whole runner every time he moves his foot, I, you know, this is no way I'm going to do this. Uh, and in particular, when you start talking about collections and things like that, people get extremely paranoid because what they know are sort of the very bad collection class libraries they have, which either have no capabilities in this case or some very primitive things. You know, sometimes there are copy on write collections where you know, every time you write to it, the entire thing gets copied. Uh, but there's a technology which is not complicated uh, and has a fancy name. It's called a persistent data structure. It has nothing to do with databases or disks. Uh, but it's a way to efficiently represent uh, a composite object as a value, as an immutable thing, and to make changes to that in, in an inexpensive way. So change for one of these uh, persistent data structures is really just you know, in quotes. They don't change. It's a function. 
that takes an existing instance of the collection or composite and returns another one that has the change in, uh, enacted. Uh, but there's a very particular meaning to persistent data structures, which is that in order to make these changes, the data structure and the change operation have to meet the performance guarantees you expect from the collection. So if it's a big O log N collection or a collection that has you know, constant time access or near constant time access, those uh, behavioral characteristics have to be met by this changing operation. It means you can't conduct a change on something that you expect to have log N behavior and copy the entire thing, because copying the entire thing is, is linear behavior, right? Uh, so that's the critical thing. The other critical aspect of persistent data structures is sometimes you'll see libraries try to cheat, okay, and they'll make the very most recent version this good immutable value, but on the way, they ruin the old version. Okay? That also is not persistent. That's another key aspect of the word persistent. In a persistent data structure, when you make the new version, the old version is perfectly fine. It's immutable. It's intact. It has the same performance guarantees. It's not decaying as you produce new values. Every functional programming language you know, tries to cheat this side and eventually says, forget this. We're going all immutable, and we're going to pay whatever the performance costs are because the logical cost of having old versions decay or have some bizarre behavior, either from a multi-threading perspective or performance perspective, is too high. Uh, so what I'm going to show you are legitimate persistent collections where the old values have the same performance characteristics. Uh, and the particular example I'm going to show you is the one that's in Clojure. Uh, it's uh, derived from some work that Phil Bagwell did uh, on these ideal, he called them ideal hash trees. And uh, they're bitmapped hash trees. Uh, that have really good performance. His versions were not uh, persistent, and so what I did for closure was I made them persistent. Uh, the secret to all persistent data structures is that they are trees. Okay. There you go. Now you know. <laughs> there, there are lots of different recipes, and I think people are very familiar with uh, you know, bee trees and red-black trees, and maybe you know, um, Erlang uses some generalized balanced trees, I think, which are interesting, and there's there's trees that use randomization techniques for balancing and, and other things. Uh, these are different. Uh, in particular, they're different because they are, um, they're trees with the eye. Some people call them tries, trees. Uh, the, the idea behind that is that you're not going to have a fixed uh, path down to a, a leaf. You're going to use only as much of a path as you need to produce a unique leaf position. Uh, you usually see these things in like string search things, or maybe I think they're also using like internet routing tables and, and stuff like that. But here the model is very simple. You, we want, at least I want it for closure, something equivalent to a hash table. I know I can't sell closure to Java programmers if it doesn't have something equivalent to a hash table. They don't want to hear about a red black tree. They know that, they know it's okay, but it's not as good as the hash tables are used to. They need something faster than that. Uh, and these are. Uh, the, way they, uh, the way they work is that you hash the value you want to put into the collection. You end up with a 32-bit hash. You're going to use the first five bits of that hash to see if there's a unique position in the first layer of your tree. So effectively, what's happening is you have a 32-way branching going on in this tree. Uh, in addition, there's some fancy bit twiddling going on in each node so that those nodes are sparse. Uh, they're not fully populated, so you're not wasting the space of, of not fully populated nodes. You end up using a, a combination of uh, population, you know, bit pop, and uh, some algorithms you copy out of, uh, what's that, Hacker's, Hacker's Delight. Hacker's Delight. So buy that. Or you can just use closures. Uh, in fact, closures, um, vectors, which is the same kind of technology, it's been ported to Factor and Scala already, um, which is fine by me. Uh, so if, if it's unique in the first five bits, we're done. We put it in the first level of the tree. If it's not, we're going to look at the next five bits and walk down one more level to the tree um, until we find some unique position, and then we're done. We're going to put the, put the value there. Uh, the key thing about this is how deep can this tree get? Well, this one's the root, so down one, two, three, four, five, six, if you had whatever, you know, Four billion things. Uh, it, it, so it branches extremely fast, and you, know, you can get a million items in depth three. It's very, very shallow. So the combination of it being very shallow and using this bit twiddling 
to walk through the sparsely populated uh, nodes in the intermediate levels makes it really fast. Uh, so that's the representation. Now we only need to talk about how do we make a changed version efficiently. And the key there, as is true for all of these things, is structural sharing. All functional data structures are, are essentially recursively defined, structurally recursively defined, um, which means that you can make a new version that shares substantial structure with the version you just had. Uh, and that's the key to making efficient copies. You're not copying everything. You're copying a very little bit. And I'll show you in a picture in a second how, how little bit you, you use. Um, since everything is immutable, sharing structure is no problem. Nothing is going to change about the structure that you're sharing, which means it's safe for multi-threaded use. It's safe for iteration. You get none of this you know, uh, mutated while iterating nonsense. So how do we share structure? We use some, uh, technology called path copying. Again, this is true for all tree data structures. They all work exactly the same way, uh, which is uh, if we ignore the right-hand path here, that's the tree I showed you before. It has 15 leaves. Okay, we want to add one under that red outlined purple guy at the bottom. We want to add a new node, add a 16th guy. So what needs to happen is we need to make a copy of that node, obviously, because we're going to be giving him a new child, a copy of his parent, and finally, the root. This copy gets one additional child. And the rest of the structure of the old version was shared. So I said level three levels could hold a million items, right? 32 times 32 times 32. Did I get that right? No, it's 32,000. A lot. No, a lot. <laughs> well, three levels down, right? Three levels down from one. If you, if you count the root, it's four levels. Uh, what, however populated this last level was, making a new node here is only ever going to copy four items. Okay, how's that old tree? Looking good, still fine. We didn't touch it. And this is the path we needed to copy to make the new one, which looks like a new tree with this extra item. Okay, if we're no longer referring to that root, it will get garbage collected, as will the things that we're referring to that are no longer referenced. This is sort of, it's kind of basic, but I want to show it because a lot of people just are not aware that this is a possible thing. This is the kind of data structure I think you should be using all the time unless you have some emergency reason. And that's why closure works this way. All the data structures work like this by default. You have to you know, go through extraordinary efforts to pick something else. Uh, OK, so that's a way to efficiently represent composite objects as values. We've got one part of the problem solved. Now we need to talk about coordination methods. Uh, the conventional way is not really a method. The conventional way is it's your problem. OK, we saw in the Scala talk there was a var. It didn't have. Um, volatile semantics, but it happened to be the case that the actor's library in Java conducts some synchronization thing which causes a happens before, happens after memory fence effect in order to make sure the contents of that var was valid in another thread. Uh, you know, in your own program, you're gonna have, that's going to be your worry. Okay, it's nice that the actor's library takes care of vars in actors, but in vars in your program otherwise are your problem. Uh, and typically, if we're trying to do composite objects, we have to use locks. And everybody knows the problems with locks, I think. Everybody know the problem with locks? Everybody know the pain of locks? OK, locks, they, they, uh, experts can build programs that work with locks. Uh, but most people don't have the time or energy to do that well. And maintaining it is really, really difficult. It's extremely difficult. So in closure, what we're going to just do is just add a level of indirection. Instead of directly referring to memory, those variables, we're going to use indirection. Uh, and then we're going to add concurrency semantics to these references. If you watched me talk yesterday, I said that, but I'll show you some more details today. So this quickly is the picture of the current state of the world in a lot of object-oriented languages. You have a lot of references to the same chunk of memory. Okay? Basically, it's a free-for-all. They don't know that they're going to see a consistent object, that all the parts are related to each other, that no one is twiddling with anything unless they can somehow stop the world. But the core problem here, now that we have lingo for it, is this unifies identity and value, right? The only place to put this value for this identity is in the same piece of memory. That's a problem. We just looked at how to do new values. It's great, except what do we need to do? We need to create some new memory, right, to represent that new value. If we say all values of, of foo have to end up in the same chunk of memory space, 
we can never do a good job. Uh, so that has a lot of problems. How do you solve this? You just use indirection. It's the solution to all computer science problems, right? One level of indirection. And now we have options, OK? Because this guy now could be immutable, right? We've separated the value, which is now immutable, and the identity, which we're going to model with these little boxes. Values never change, right? If you want to see the current state of an identity, you have to dereference it. You have to say, give me your state. What you get out of that is a value that can't change. You can spend all day looking at it, just like you can spend all day looking at the photo to try to see if the runner was uh, foul. Uh, I, I want to emphasize, if you think your object-oriented programming languages encapsulation techniques are a solution to this problem, that is not true. Okay? If you have a variable or a field inside your object and you write three methods that can change that field and people can call those methods from different threads, you haven't encapsulated anything from a concurrency standpoint. Okay? You've just spread the problem and hit it behind something. Uh, so I'm going to call those boxes references. Uh, we have too many overloaded terms. I can't think of any new words. Um, it's a reference because it's, it refers to something else. So identities are references that refer to their values. Uh, but the critical thing is, in Clojure, these are the only things that you can mutate, unless you drop to Java and use Java stuff. Of course, there's still classes and arrays and all that. But if you want to follow the Clojure model, you're going to have these references. They're the only things that can change. And what they do is just manage time. Okay? Uh, in other words, you can atomically move from one value, which is immutable, to another value, which is immutable. And each of the reference types provides different semantics for time. Uh, so what are the characteristics of, of, of these semantics? One of, which is, one of them is, can other people see these changes I'm making? Is it shared? Because okay, there's one way to manage time, which is uh, the uh, Star Trek alternate universe model, where there's a bad Kirk in one universe timeline and a good Kirk in, in another, and they, they'll never meet. Of course, the problem with that is that occasionally they do meet. Uh, but one way is isolation. So we'll see the last model is isolation. But in general, most of these models are around uh, making changes that other parts of your program can see. So sharing. The second part is synchronicity. And here we mean synchronicity in the sense of uh, now. What now means to the caller. In other words, from a self-relative standpoint, is the change I'm asking for going to happen now or at some other time relative to me? Is it independent? And we're going to call those differences synchronous. If it happens now relative to me, it's synchronous. If it doesn't happen now relative to me, it's asynchronous. It just happens at some, other, some point in the future. Can't say exactly when. And the final characteristic of these references, where, you know, again, you get different choices and options, is whether or not the change is coordinated. Okay? I can be an independent runner and run all by myself, and I'm completely fine. Uh, but a lot of times, you need to move something from one collection to another collection, right? You don't ever want it to be in both. You don't ever want it to be in neither. Okay? That requires coordination. That's impossible to do with independent uh, autonomous entities. You need coordination. And it ends up that in the local case, you can do coordination. Distributing coordination like this is you know, a fool's errand, probably. But people keep trying. Uh, I, I don't think that there's ever going to be distributed coherent, coordinated change. But people are already recognizing the fact that you know, if you're willing to delay consistency, you can sort of have uh, coordination. But in the local model, it's perfectly possible to get coordinated change. Uh, otherwise, change is autonomous. Okay? I change by myself. I don't care what you're doing. We, and no two of us can do something together. So now we have these, these, four, these three characteristics. Closure has four types of references that have, make different choices in these three areas. Refs are shared. People can see the changes. They're synchronous. They change right now. Uh, they change in a transaction, which means that you can change more than one reference in the same transaction, and those changes will be coordinated. It's sort of the hardest problem is that coordinated change problem. Agents are autonomous. They'll feel a lot more like actors in an actor model. They're shared. People can see them. Uh, they're asynchronous. So you ask for a change, it's going to happen at some point in the future, but you're going to immediately return. Uh, and they're autonomous. There's no coordinating the activities of, of agents. 
Uh, atoms are shared. People can see the changes. They're synchronous. They have them right now. So that's the difference between them and agents. Uh, and they're also uh, autonomous. You can't change more than one atom in a single unit of work. And finally, closure has uh, something called VARs. They isolate changes with the you know good Kirk, bad Kirk, alternate universe model. There is only, uh, for any identity, there's a unique value in every thread. So you can't possibly see the changes in different threads. I'm not going to talk too much about that. That's kind of a special purpose construct um, derived from lists. OK, so one of the things that's nice about the way these references work is they have a uniform state transition model. All of them have different functions that change the, the state, that say move from one state to another state. Uh, and they use different names because they have different semantics. I don't want people to get all confused about is this happening asynchronously or synchronously or do I need a transaction. But the model is always the same. You're going to take a, uh, call one of the changing functions. You're going to pass the reference, the box. And you're going to say, please use this function. So you're going to pass a function, maybe with these arguments. Apply it to the current state of the box and use its return value as the new state. Okay, so the function will be passed the current state under some constraints, either atomically, within a transaction, some way, it will be past the current state. It can calculate a new state. Again, it's a pure function you're passing. That new state becomes the new value of the reference. Uh, you can always, in closures references, you can always uh, see the current state of a reference by dereferencing it. In other words, that's the local visibility, because it's completely free to do. Um, and it yields much more efficient programs to be able to do that. If you have to ask for permission to see collections every time you see them, it, it, it doesn't work in the local context. Um, in addition, one of the other shared attributes of these things is that they, there's no user locking. You don't have any locking to do this work, and they, they, none of these con constructs can deadlock. So what does it mean to edit something in this new world? You're going to have a reference to a value, right? We can make a new value a la carte on the side. We, you know, we're going to call a function and create this new value, which we intend to become the new state of foo. All right? The new value is a function of the old. It can share structure. We just saw that. Doing this doesn't impede anybody who's reading foo, right? They're completely free to keep reading. They don't have to stop while we figure out the new version of foo. Um, in addition, it's not impeded by people reading. We don't have to wait for people to stop reading so we can start making a new version. Uh, this is the kind of thing you're going to need for high throughput concurrency. And then going to a new state is just an atomic swapping of this box to look at the new value, the new immutable value. Uh, that's always coordinated. There's always rules for how that happens. I just showed you the multiple semantics. Anytime somebody dereferences this after, okay, more time words, after this happens, they'll see the new value. Consumers are unaffected. Okay, if I was looking at the old value, I, I don't get disturbed by this happening. I'm just looking at an old value. It's like I'm looking at a picture of the runner to see, I mean, I know the race is over. That's OK. We need to behave that way. If you've been programming for so long, as I have, that it, you know, it's really hard to break from, I own the world, and I stop the world, and the world goes when I say go. And, I mean, we have to just break from that. That's, that's the future. We have to understand that we're going to, be, going to be working with data that is not necessarily the very latest data. That's just the future for us. OK, so the hard references, as I said, are the, the transactional ones. Uh, Closure has a software transactional memory system. I almost hate using this term because people like to criticize STM as if it was one thing. There's a whole bunch of different STMs. They have radically different characteristics. Closures is radically different from the other ones. Uh, but they all share some things, which is basically a model that feels a lot like a database model. You can only change them within a transaction. All the changes you make to an entire set of references, uh, refs, inside a transaction uh, happen together or none of them happen. Okay, that's atomicity. Um, you don't see the effects of any other transactions while you're running. They don't see your effects. It's the normal things. The one unique thing about STM transactions is that they're speculative. Right? You may not win. Somebody else may win. And you will automatically retry up to a certain limit, uh, which means that your transactions cannot contain side effects. Uh, this is the way you do coordination. You can't really do coordination without some technique like this. You can't build a system on independent entities and, and do this, this kind of work. So in practice, what do you do? You just wrap your code with do sync, which just be, means this is a transaction. There are two functions, alter and commute, which work like I described. They take a function, a reference and a function and some args and say, apply this to the reference in the transaction and make the return value the new state. 
Internally, Clojure uses multi-version concurrency control, which I also think is a very critical component to doing STM in a way that's going to work in the real world. A lot of STM designs are, you know, you just write your app in the terrible way you were with your object-oriented language, you know, banging on fields, and STM is magically going to make that better. I don't believe in that at all. Closure's STM is not designed for that kind of work. If you make every part of your object a ref, it isn't going to work, and I, I'm not going to feel bad for you, because I just explained how to do it. You make your object a value and atomically switch that value, and everything is better. But you do have this issue of, again, people would criticize STMs universally, because most STMs do something called read tracking. In order to you know, make sure that nothing bad happened while your um, transaction was going on, they track every read that you do, in addition to all the writes that you do. I also believe that that is not going to work. Um, so Clojure does no read tracking. The way it accomplishes that is with a technique called multi-version concurrency control, which is the way Oracle and PostgreSQL work as databases, where essentially old values can be kept around in order to provide a snapshot of the world for transactions, uh, while other transactions that are writing can continue. That ends up being extremely effective, but it falls out of this necessity to be using uh, uh, references to values. It's got to be cheap for me to keep an old value around for you, right? I just showed you how it is cheap if you're using persistent data structures. All these things go together. If you don't do all this stuff together, you don't have an answer to this problem, in my opinion. Uh, but when you, when you do this, it's really nice. So MVCC uh, STM does not do retracking. Uh, so what does it look like in practice? Uh, we define foo to be a ref, that's a transactional box, to that map. Okay, we can dereference foo and we see what's in there. Unfortunately, the name's order changes because they're hash maps, so they don't guarantee any uh, order of iteration. We can go and m manipulate the value inside foo. We can say, give me the map that's inside foo and, and associate the A key with Lucy. That returns a new value. Right? Nothing about that impacted the reference. Right? I took the value out. I made another value. Okay, we can do all kinds of calculations completely outside of the transactional system. It's still a functional programming language. Right? Get the value out and write functional programs. Um, so that didn't have any effect on foo. Okay, we can go and we can use that commute function, which actually says, you know, take a reference, commute a reference with the function asoc, which adds a value to a map, the key A and the value Lucy. And that fails because there's a semantics to those refs, which is that you can only do this for refs inside a transaction. So you get an error. If, you, however, you put that same work inside a transaction, it succeeds. And when the transaction is complete, that is the value of foo. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to talk about the implementation details, but again, don't think that STM is one thing. If you've read one paper on STM, you know nothing about STM. If you've read all the papers about STM, you know a little bit more than nothing about STM. None of us know anything about STM. This is still a research topic. Uh, but I do know this. Uh, this works, and it works really well, and it makes it easy to write programs that don't use locks. I think all the programs that I've written in my career, I could have used this anytime I needed coordinated change, and it would have been fine. People can bang on it and try to push the scalability issues and whatnot. Uh, from a correctness standpoint, this is a godsend. Uh, however, inside, uh, unlike some STMs, Closure's STM is not spinning optimistic. It does use locks. Uh, it uses wait notify. It does not churn. Processes will wait for other processes. It's got deadlock detection. It's got age-based barging. Uh, there's extreme minimum. In fact, I think what is actually the minimum amount of sharing in the transactional system, which is one CAS, which is the, for the timestamps. You know, people have demonstrated you can hammer on one CAS continuously with 80 threads, and that's about the limit of scalability. But when you actually have some work in your transactions, it's no problem. You know, I've run stuff on an Azul box with 600 cores, and uh, that CAS is not going to be the problem. Uh, as I said, there's no read tracking. It is important that this STM is designed for coarse grained orientation. It's not one of these snake oil STMs that you can do what you were doing. You have to do this new thing. You have to use references to immutable values. Then you can use my STM. Uh, it's not going to make your old programs good. Uh, and uh, readers don't then get impeded by writers and, and, and vice versa. It also supports commute, which I don't really have time to explain right now. I do want to show you one other model, because it's very different, and it's nice in that it's very different, yet very much the same, because we've sort of isolated 
change from values, you can take a completely different approach to time. Okay, so in an agent, which is another kind of these reference cells, uh, each agent is completely independent. They have their own state and uh, it cannot be coordinated with any other. Uh, state changes through actions, which are essentially just ordinary functions that you're going to send to the agent with the function called send or send off. Uh, that function is going to return immediately. So you're going to send this function and some data, say, you know, at some point in the future, apply this function to the current value of the agent with these arguments and make the new return value of the function the new state of the agent. Um, that happens asynchronously on a thread from a thread pool. Um, only one action per agent happens at a time, so agents essentially have sort of an input, you know, mailbox queue. So they also do all their work serially. It's another promise of the semantics of, of an agent. Uh, again, as with the other reference types, you can just dereference it and see what's in there. Uh, if you do successive actions to agents inside the same action, they ha are held until the uh, action completes, so they can see the new state. Uh, the agents do coordinate with transactions, which is kind of nice. So one of the problems is you saw no side effects in transactions. So you're wondering, you know, how do I send, let somebody know I completed this transaction successfully? I need to send them a message or do something side effecty. Uh, it ends up that if you send an agent action during a transaction, that's held until the transaction commits. So if the transaction gets retried, those messages don't go out until the transaction actually succeeds. So that coordination is a really nice feature. These two things work together. Um, they're not quite actors. The difference with an actor model is that's a distributed model. You don't have direct access to the state in an actor model uh, because you can't, because you can't distribute that. Um, since I'm not doing distribution, I can let you access the state directly, um, which means it's a suitable place to put something that you actually may need to share a lot without necessarily serializing activity. So what does this look like to use? I say def foo to be an agent referring to a map. I dereference it. I see the contents of the map. I send that reference, the same function, associate A with Lucy. I look at it right away. It may not be there yet. Right. Some amount of time will pass. Don't, I can't promise you what. And then it will be different. Okay. This is a different way of thinking about things, but people who program in Erlang completely do amazing things thinking about things this way. Right? Things can be asynchronous. You cannot keep programming your, your computer as if it was you know, your old Apple and there was only you and your assembly language and you, know, you were king of the universe. Uh, things happen at the same time now. Atoms, a very similar story to agents. Right? They're independent. You can't coordinate change to atoms. Uh, there's a different name for the state change function. It's called swap. Again, it takes an ordinary function of the old state to the new state. Uh, it, the change happens synchronously now. So that's the difference between atoms and agents. It happens right now. Uh, this is a model for a compare and swap. Okay, compare and, uh, compare and swap or compare and set is a, is a primitive that is going to let you look at a piece of compare and set memory and say, I want it to turn into this. And it will turn into this only if it's no longer, only if it is still that. So you look at it, you see it's that. You want to turn it into this. If it's still that inside atomically, it'll say, OK, I'll make it this. The problem with CAS like by itself is you usually want to read the value, do something with it, and then put it back. And then so you get this interval between when you looked at it and when you tried to do the CAS. And of course, when you do that and somebody else has done something, that CAS is going to fail. And then what do you do? Well, typically, a well-written CAS thing, where CAS is a suitable data structure, uh, will have a little spin loop. Right, you're going to spin in a value into a CAS. Well, atoms do the spinning for you. Uh, as a result, the function may be called more than once. Again, we're in this world where you should be programming with these side effect free functions because they need to be called more than once, both in transactions and in atoms. So you have to avoid side effects, but the value you get out of this is that when you succeed, you know the function you applied was applied to the value the function was passed, and the result that got put in had no intervening activity occur on that atom. Uh, that's a powerful construct you need to have. And look at these. That looks like all like the other ones, right? Define foo to be an atom that refers to that map, right? Dereference it, it's there. We swap immediately, we get the new value. So this is uniform state transition model, right? That's what refs look like. Start a transaction, commute or alter your ref, passing a function and some arguments. The result of the function is your new value. Agents, same thing, except completely different time semantics. It happens asynchronously in a thread pool sometime later. You return immediately. 
atoms happen right now, but are independent from the others. You need all these things to write a real multi-threaded program, especially in the local model. These are all things that I need to do in my career, writing concurrent programs in the local part of the program, and I don't think you can do without them. So here they are, but it's a uniform way to go. So, in summary, uh, immutable values are critical for functional programming, but it ends up they're also critical for uh, state. Right? We cannot really manage time and state without immutable values. If you're going to let two things change, time and, and value, you're, you can't do anything uh, that's reliable. Uh, persistent data structures let you uh, represent composite objects efficiently, immutably. Uh, once you're able to accept this constraint of immutability on your values, you have all these options. I mean, I'm working on a fifth reference type uh, with different, slightly different semantics. It's easy to do because I've separated time management from value management. Uh, and finally, uh, I think this is pretty easy to use. Um, you know, if you've seen some other models, uh, this is a lot like variables at work. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs>